Um, so today uh, is Legion week, so we're going to be talking about logical dependence analysis uh, in Legion today. So what I want to do is kind of like start looking at how the runtime actually computes dependencies um, uh, between different tasks and the different stages of how we do that dependence computation. Um, and today we're going to focus on the logical analysis, uh, which is you know this stage in the pipeline. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about um, you know what goes into this. You know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what happens in the count of it. What's that? Is the audio not good? No. Oh. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. I'll keep going. Um. Okay. So. Uh, so we're going to focus on this stage today, um, and we'll also look at you know some of the stuff that happens in the in the decode stage to kind of lead in that they'll be used in this dependence analysis stage. And of course, like the whole reason we're computing dependence analysis is to actually enable the the mapping physical analysis, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but before we dive into the code, I think it's useful to actually like look at a little example of what this like looks like to, in practice, um, and you know some of the challenges associated with this. So you know let's actually do a Quick little example here. Um, so this is the uh, you know for those of you who have worked through the Legion tutorial, this is uh, tutorial number eight, which is the multiple partitions. It's probably the most interesting, like like smallest simple example that you can do that actually has like a non-trivial partitioning that you know causes some interesting stuff to happen in the logical dependence analysis. And so you know if I run this um, with Legion Spy uh, and generate a Legion Spy log file, I can then you know use Legion Spy to actually generate. Um, uh, the dependence analysis and the event graph uh, uh, for this this run, right? Um, and if we actually look at this, um, right, I can actually zoom in here. This is this is the data. This is dependence analysis, the logical analysis outputs. So this computation, we're going to ignore these refinement nodes here, but effectively there's an index based task launch. This purple box here, right? That's going to initialize you know our array of data for the stencil computation. We'll talk about what this uh, this close op here is actually doing and where it comes from. Then we have a stencil code that effectively reads one field and writes to another field, re reading the alias partition and writing to the disjoint partition. Right? And then we've got a single ch check task down here that actually looks at the whole top level region and actually outputs that. And, and just to you know make all this very obvious, we can generate you know the the, the region graph um, for this uh, uh, computation um, and actually take a look at that. Right, and so this is the region tree for this computation. Um, let me zoom in just a little bit. Hopefully that's nice and big and everybody can read it. Right, so there's one partition over here of four subregions that broke up our, our array. You know, this is a disjoint and complete uh, partition. Just broke our nice, you know, 1024 element array into, into four chunks. Right, and then over here we've got the alias partition. Right, you can see disjoint equals false here. Right, and effectively you've got, you know, each of these chunks plus a little bit of boundary region that they need from their neighbors uh, in order to actually compute the stencil, right? And so when you look at like this uh, computation here, right, this stencil, right, is reading from partition two, right, which is this alias partition over here, right? Um, and then it's writing to partition one, which is the disjoint partition uh, over here. Um, so, so the interesting thing about this is that, you know, this is the first, like the simplest probably example that you can do because it has two tasks that are each going to use different partitions, right? And that's sort of like the first interesting example or the smallest interesting example that you can do in Legion is like two tasks that, that use different partitions and you have to really reason about the dependencies between them. Um, and so what we want to do is look at, you know, how is this graph actually actually computed and what are some of the properties that, that go into that? Um, so if we jump back here um, to our pipeline, right? So the logical dependence analysis stage is, is effectively the stage responsible for computing this graph right here, right? And I guess one important thing to call out here is that you'll notice that, you know, the blocks here are actually like representing index based operations, right? So these, like the stencil computation here, this is actually not a single stencil task. This is actually in this particular case representing an index base of stencil tasks, and right? And this is representing an index base of, of init field tasks, right? So it's not actually showing you all the individual point tasks. And in fact, if we actually go look at the individual at the physical event, the realm event graph that gets computed, right? I can actually uh, open that up here, right? This is what actually runs, right? In realm, right? This is actually the realm event graph that actually gets produced for this computation, right? And you can see there's four init tasks and there's four stencil tasks here. 
And notice that there's actually like point-wise dependencies computed, you know, from you know for each of the stencil tasks based on the init task that they depend on, and then you know for the check task on all the stencils, right? And so it actually has done like a point-wise precise dependence analysis. But when you look at the at the at the logical dependence analysis, right, you don't see those, right? You just see like a, a single node here for an index based operation. And so the logical dependence analysis is actually going to happen at the granularity of, you know, of of index based operations that are being launched, and not necessarily, you know, all the individual little point tasks. Uh, and that's actually going to be be somewhat important. Um, okay, so let's go back here to this uh, picture here, right? So the dependence analysis. The logical dependence analysis, right, is you know effectively, uh, uh, it's going to end up computing dependencies between these top-level operations that get kicked off, whether they're tasks or index-based tasks or copies or other kinds of things. Um, and importantly, you know, one property that you can always guarantee in this, this stage of the pipeline is the runtime will always guarantee that these logical dependence analysis stages, you know, for each individual task, happen in the order that they're issued uh, from the parent task. Right, and so you know each subtask or each sub index based task launch that you do, you know, will run through the stage in the order that it was launched. Right, and that's actually going to be you know something that you can you can lean on when you're actually doing this this dependence analysis. Right, and it's going to compute dependencies. You know, effectively by computing this graph right here, it's going to compute dependencies between these things to determine the order in which they can run in this mapping physical analysis stage. Right, so effectively, you know, you can actually run things. Uh, multiple tasks can be going through this mapping phase in parallel, right? Assuming that they don't have any any dependencies computed by this logical dependence analysis stage here, right? So tasks that, you know, potentially have things happening in parallel here, right, could potentially run through this mapping stage uh, in parallel. So these dependencies are actually important, right? We want to we want to actually like you know uh, try to find some parallels in there so that you know multiple things can be running through the mapping analysis uh, in parallel, and that determines this partial order here of you know how things how things run through here, um, and and of course this is what act, this this stage is what actually computes the realm event graph and does things like allocate resources and stuff like that. Um, so we're not going to look at the physical analysis too much today, really at all, um, or or resource allocations. But it is important that like you know this dependence analysis actually find some parallelism to make you know more allow more things to run through this mapping stage uh, in parallel. I guess one important thing I should add here is that this stage is actually can be imprecise. Um, I should say it's sound, um, but imprecise. Right. And what I mean by that is that, like, you know, effectively, if you have a dependent, if there's ultimately going to be a dependence between two tasks here, like if there is going to be an init task, or, or sorry, a stencil task that depends on an init task, like there is in this case, there has to be a path of dependencies here between these in the logical dependence analysis, and that's that's what I mean by sound. But what I when I say it's imprecise, what I mean is you can actually have extra errors in here, right? That are not necessarily perfectly representing the dependence analysis. You can have like, you know, unnecessary dependencies here, and that's still okay, um, because the physical analysis, the mapping analysis, is actually going to be both sound and precise. So these are properties of these two stages, right? As soundness is always important, right? If we're not sound, then we could be giving back wrong answers. So that soundness is required everywhere, but. You know, it's okay for this logical dependence analysis stage to be a little bit imprecise, whereas the mapping stage will actually be perfectly precise and compute um, like this event graph, right, which has exactly the pointwise dependencies between the tasks that are that are actually there. Um, okay, um, right, and and what you're going to see, I'll, I'll mention this stage just so we have some context when we go to look at at this stage. But this decode stage is effectively something that happens before the dependence analysis stage. Um, so we're get, the runtime will actually guarantee that, like for any operation that's running through the pipeline, we'll guarantee that this decode stage or pre-pipeline stage is always finished, you know, before you start the dependence analysis stage. But importantly, you know, the runtime can actually run the decode stage for multiple different tasks that have been issued out of order. Right, so actually, like you know, two tasks might be running through this, you know, this decode stage out of order with respect to each other, but they'll get reordered by the time they get to this dependence analysis stage. By the time you get dependence analysis, everything goes through this stage in the order that it happens in, or, or that it was issued from the from the parent task. So, so just some invariants to keep in mind as we're as we're work, working through this today. Okay, let's actually go look at some code here, and actually try to digest some of this stuff. Uh, there's our nice Teams picture. Okay. All right. So if you recall, um, you know we looked at this in a in a previous lecture, but you know pretty much all the stages of the pipeline come with a trigger, you know underscore something method, right? And in particular, like 
you know, the dependence analysis stage is this, you know, trigger dependence analysis me method call that you get back on an operation class, right? And the runtime will give you that call back when it's time to actually run the dependence analysis for this uh, for this particular particular task, right? And so, in, as a part of this, you know, the, the execution of this uh, this stage of the pipeline, its primary goal is to compute the dependencies associated with this event graph. So effectively, it's trying to hook up, you know, for let's let's say we're looking at this stencil. You know, it needs to hook up dependencies on any uh, previous operations that came before it, like this init task, right? It needs to be able to record dependencies on any of them for which it might ultimately have a dependence, you know, in the physical analysis stage. Um, and so you effectively are in the in the job of creating these arrows, you know, back to this init task uh, back here, right? And we'll talk about where this inner close op comes from, but you know, it's, it's okay as long if your dependence analysis is, or your dependencies are transitive, right? So you don't need to actually record a like, you know, a direct link back to this init field task, right? It's okay if your dependencies, you know, are, are sort of transitively implied through some other operation like one of these in, in interclose ops. Just there needs to be a path through here to anything that, you know, you might ultimately depend on uh, that came earlier than you in the execution. Okay, so how do you actually go about doing that? Well, if we actually look at this uh, this dependence analysis function, um, it's going to do a couple of things. So first, let's actually go look at this this perform based dependence analysis because because it'll actually show you some examples of dependencies that exist you know not on regions. Um, and then we're going to do the dependence analysis on what happens you know how do you actually analyze the regions regions themselves. And actually, let me actually move to the index based task uh, version of this because that's actually um, what we're actually going to be looking at uh, at here. Okay, so you know, here's the index-based task version of trigger dependence analysis. So this is what's actually being executed by like init task and stencil task and so forth. And you see it has the same flavor. There's a there's a base dependence analysis function, and then you know we're going to analyze each of the region requirements for this task uh, down here. So let's let's actually look at perform base dependence analysis first. Oh, if I can type. Okay, here's the base dependence analysis uh, function on this, right? Um, there are a couple of privilege checks. I actually need to move these uh, into a place where they actually get done, you know, when the task is launched. Uh, so these are not actually doing anything. These are like error checking codes for, for users. So we're going to skip that part. Um, here's the first kind of dependence analysis that you can you might have on a prior task that came before you. And that is on any task that produced any futures. So if you had a dependence on any tasks, uh, on any futures that were produced by like a prior task in your same parent task, Right, you want to record a mapping dependence on them, right? Because effectively, you need to know that they've, you know, finished producing those those futures, and you're going to be able to map those futures uh, as part of your physical analysis, right? And so it's only safe to do that if you've, if you know, if those prior tasks have finished mapping those those futures and so forth, right? And so they they effectively say, you know, uh, they actually call this uh, register dependence uh, on this uh, future. And if we actually look at that method, let's actually pull that up over here. So we go look in runtime.cc and we look at future impl register dependence. Right here's our consumer op. Right, effectively, is if the producer op, you know, if this future had a producer op, right, they might not. Right, some futures are made from the application. They might just like give us a, a raw future, right. But if there was a producer op, right, we'll check to see if it's like in the same context as us. Uh, if it is in the same context as us, we call this register dependence uh, function. And to show you where, let me just show you where that is. We're probably not going to go look at that today, but I will actually show you um, where you can actually find that in case you do want to go look at it. So in Legion Ops, there is a register dependence, right, uh, on a particular operation, right? And so effectively, you know, you call that, and what that does is it, it takes, you know, for this particular operation that it's being invoked on, it's going to record a dependence from this operation, the this member of, of the operation, and point the arrow back at the previous uh, operation that it depended on, right? So in this example here, that's the same as like, you know, the target is effectively this thing. So it's actually the reverse of the direction the arrows point in this picture. But effectively, the target would be like the thing you're actually trying to add the dependence on, and, and then this is the, uh, the the operation on which this method is being invoked, right? And so that effectively draws an arrow from like here to here. Right uh, uh, by calling this this particular method, um, and you actually see there's there's two flavors of method, right? This is sort of the one that you use if you're not doing it on a region requirement, right? And so it effectively just draws a generic mapping dependence uh, between those two operations. There's a more specialized one down here uh, that actually records some more information for when you do this for a region requirement dependence, 
uh, and we're going to see an example of that uh, uh, here in just a little bit. Okay, um, but but effectively these are the two things that you use to draw those. These two methods right here are what you use to to make those dependencies. And you know you're welcome to go dig into those those methods, but you can also just treat them as black boxes. Like they, they work on any kind of operation. So like it doesn't matter whether you're hooking up dependencies between tasks or copies or inline mappings or dependent partitioning operations or any kind of operation going through the pipeline. Right, you can record a dependence uh, using using these methods, um, and so that creates these edges uh, in the in the logical dependence analysis graph. Okay, uh, let's jump back to the code here. Um, so we looked at at future impl, and effectively that adds this dependence here. Um, and you see, there's also some legions by logging to go along with that for recording this, so we can actually check this stuff uh, offline. Uh, but we'll do we'll do that in a future lecture. Um, okay, where were we? Right. Okay. So back to the futures. Right. Uh, effectively, that's how you register dependence on the on on futures. Um, you, you also have to register dependencies on any predicates that you do. Uh, you can also register dependencies on future maps that you might have uh, that you might need to access. So you record dependencies on all those, and also do it on like wait and arrive barriers and and stuff like that. So these are effectively like name based dependence analysis, right? Like effectively, you're saying like, you know, for all these resources that I need. Uh, record any mapping dependencies on anything in my same parent task that produced those things and record record those those mapping dependencies. Um, so that's a pretty simple simple method. Now, if we jump back to index task uh, trigger dependence analysis, so that effectively handles all like the basic resources, like the things that we have names for. But now we also need to do the same kind of analysis uh, on the regions that our task is asked for, asked for, right? And this is where things get a little tricky because like you can't just do this using names anymore, right? You actually have to look for for interferences on like alias regions, right? Just you know refreshing, um, right? Like in this particular case, right? Like the stencil task is or, or the init task writes to this partition, but then the stencil task is going to be reading from this partition, right? So we have one task on this partition and one task using this partition. So how are we actually going to hook up dependencies between those uh, between those two tasks. Okay. Well, so what we're going to do is um, what we're going we're to do is we're going to iterate over each of the region requirements that our task is going to have. So this logical regions is just a vector of our of, of referencing our, our set of region requirements. In fact, you can see us digging out our region requirement here from this uh, this logical regions vector here, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to traverse this region tree to try and identify any interfering prior tasks or operations that have have been recorded uh, you know uh, on this particular region tree that we're trying to access as part of this this task launch as part of this region requirement so let's uh, let's go look at this uh, this region tree here so let me try and give you the high level overview of what's going to happen and then we'll go look at the code to, to kind of map that uh, into what's actually happening uh, in practice okay so the idea of you know logical defense analysis what's going to happen is that Every single operation that has come before us in our in our parent task is going to have recorded itself at the upper bound, you know, effectively at the region or partition, which rep represents the upper bound of the data that it's going to need to access, right? So it will, they will all exist in this region tree somewhere. Like if we had subtasks that were hitting each of these subregions, they would have recorded them on each of their on each of these subregions and and stored themselves in the region tree, you know, at this location. To say I'm using like this subregion, or in the case of like the init task in this particular example, it will have recorded itself as you know using this partition, as writing this partition, right? Just to, to make it very clear, right? The init task writes partition one one, right? And so it will have, oh, let's see, it will have recorded itself, you know, on this node of the region tree, and it will be sitting here as a writer uh, of this partition. Right, and so when the stencil task, you know, goes to do the analysis, what its job is to do is to find, you know, all prior operations, you know, in this region tree that it's about to access. Right, and in this particular case, it's going to be reading this partition uh, for the for the the one field. Right, it needs to find all the prior operations that it might interfere with. Right, as part of its physical dependence analysis. Right, and so the way that we do this is what we do is we actually traverse this region tree. To actually, from in this particular case, from the root, and I'm gonna I'm gonna generalize this in a minute, but but for now, just assume we start at the root, and we're gonna walk down to the node that we need to to actually access. So like if we're analyzing the stencil task, we're gonna start at this region node and walk to the node that we actually need to access, which is this partition, and look for any interferences at every level of the tree, right? And so the way that we do this 
is effectively every node in this tree tracks whether there are any operations in other in any subtrees, right? And so like as the stencil task comes in and you know hits this root node here, it's gonna say first off before I walk down my, to my next node, are there any open subtrees that I might interfere with? And if so, let's go traverse those and look for any interferences that I might have with them, right? So it gets so 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 like the stencil task is gonna come here. It's gonna say, okay, first off, are there any open subtrees, right? And, and it's gonna say, yes, there's an open subtree over here because the init task is down here in the subtree writing to this disjoint partition over here, right? And so the, the, the central task will be here and I'll say, okay, I need to go, even though I need to walk to this tree, right? This is where I'm gonna record myself as a user, right? I need to first uh, traverse this subtree over here and actually like record dependencies on the things that are over here. Uh, to actually, um, you know, uh, hook up, you know, that I might have a dependence on them because, you know, I don't know anything about this partition and how it relates to this partition, right? They're two different partitions of the same parent region. They might be interfering with each other. So I have to traverse this over here and record mapping dependencies on anything in the subtree down here that I might actually interfere with. Okay. Um, and so it's going it, to, it, it'll, it'll first traverse the subtree. It'll walk down to this node and say, okay, there's an init task here that, you know, I clearly am going to have a dependence because I'm reading and it's writing and, uh, and, and it's in a potentially aliasing partition with the one that I need to access. And so I will record a mapping dependence uh, on this particular, particular uh, uh, init, init user down here. And then, you know, once it's done that, it'll say, okay, are there any more open children down here below this? And of course, the answer in this particular case is no. Right, like the only user here is this init task, you know, at this partition. And so then you can like return up this tree, come back, right? And then you can continue your traversal down to this node over here, at which point, you know, the init, the, the stencil task will actually record itself and say, okay, I'm using this partition now, right? And, and when something else comes in later, right, in particular, like let's just uh, continue this, uh, this example. The next thing that comes along in this uh, dependence graph, right, is actually this check task, right? And this check task is actually using uh, the root region, right? So it's using uh, this region right here, right? So so it, its traversal is really simple. It gets to this node, but it still has to say like, are there any open sub, sub trees in here that I need to traverse to look for any dependencies? And, and of course the answer will be will be yes. You know there are two prior open sub trees, right? And so you need to traverse down here and record dependence on the on the init task and record a dependence down, or traverse down this sub tree and record a dependence on the the stencil task. Right, and then and then at that point, you know, it will be able to record itself as a user of this region right here for the check task, right? And so I, I, I'm skipping a couple of steps here, a couple of important optimizations, but conceptually, this is what's happening, right? Every new operation that comes into this, you know, into this, this uh, you know, to, to analyze this, its logical region, it's gonna traverse the subtrees and look for anything that's interfering uh, uh, with itself and record a mapping dependence on those things. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Are there questions about this? Is the is the left partition still open by the time we get to the check task? Yeah, yeah. So that's gonna be one of the optimizations. Um, uh, and effectively, I'm gonna to talk to about you know opening and closing these subtrees. Uh, for now, I'm kind of presenting it as if you know this subtree just stays open once something starts using it down here, and nothing gets pruned out of the subtree. But, but for in practice, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna, and I'm gonna talk about this next, is effectively be able to, you know, effectively, you're gonna be able to determine when it's safe to prune things out of here and make it possible to close up a subtree so you don't have to traverse it again in the future after something has already traversed it. So that, that's gonna be an important optimization that we're gonna do, and I will definitely talk about that today. Any other questions? If not, I will start doing the optimization that Manolis. Well, well actually, what I'll probably do is you know, let me describe the optimization then, because that's what the code will actually show, and then we'll go go take a look at it, look at the code, and see how it actually works. Okay, so let, let me just dive into that. All right, so so Manolis actually raised a, a good point, which is that you know effectively one of the interesting things that happened here is that you know, when the stencil task actually recorded dependence on the init task over here, right? it actually did something interesting, which is it actually, you know, it sort of traversed this subtree here and recorded dependencies on everything in it. Now, there was only one interesting thing in the subtree, but 
you know, there could have been more, right? You could have had several, you know, reading index-based task launches over here. You could have had like point tasks that were in each of these subregions, right? Or, or sorry, individual tasks in each of these subregions. You, you don't really know what you're going to find when you go down this particular subtree and what you're going to record dependencies on. So the runtime actually does something interesting, um, which is that if you're if you're traversing from this root node uh, down to your particular node, and you have to go traverse one of these subtrees that's not on the path that you're walking on, right? Um, what we do is we actually make what we call a merge close operation, um, and that is what these red boxes are. So these, and I, I call them inter close ops in this uh, in this picture here, but. In the runtime, they're actually called merge close ops. I've, I've kind of renamed them a little bit. And I should actually probably just update Legion Spy to call these merge close ops. But effectively, what a merge close op is going to do is effectively it's going to produce a summary of all the operations in the subtree. So if we go back to the picture over here, right? So if you're if you're the stencil task, you've come into this, this root region node and you're trying to traverse down to this partition, but you realize there's a subtree open over here. You could just go and traverse it and record dependencies on everything in the subtree and leave it open and then continue your traversal down here, right? And then the next thing that comes down here that also wants to traverse over here, it also has to go down here and traverse everything over here and then come back up and go back down, right? And so like, that's actually kind of inefficient. So instead what we do is like, effectively, if you're gonna actually record dependencies on everything in the subtree, you actually make what's called a merge close operation at this region node, right? The node that sort of is the upper bound of where you're traversing, you know, for this entire subtree down here. And then that merge close up summarizes a dependence on everything in this subtree, right? And, and then we, and effectively everything in the subtree that we interfere with gets recorded as a dependence, you know, on that merge close up. And then we can record the merge close up at this node and then we can forget everything in the subtree that we've you know, previously recorded a, a dependence on, right? Because effectively it's summarized up here in, in the, by the merge close op using this particular node with like a read write uh, privilege, right? And so if we actually look at this picture, uh, where'd it go? So that you notice this inner close op, it actually says it's on this region 111, you know, the root region here, right? If I jump back, oh, sorry, wrong tab there. Uh, so if you actually end up on this, uh, on this, um, it, it records its summary on this root region node as summarizing, you know, uh, effectively all of the operations that were in this subtree, they all get summarized by this one merge close up that gets placed at this root node here. And now anything that comes in later and needs to traverse down the subtree as well can just record a dependence on that merge close up uh, and, and jump over here because you know, after we recorded this merge close up here, we can forget everything in the subtree over here that we've recorded dependence on. Now I'll point out that this only applies to the case where the merge close up actually, you know, records a dependence on everything over here, right? So you might actually have some stuff still in this tree, which, you know, is non-interfering, um, uh, in which case you need to leave this subtree open. But there's that those are some really unusual circumstances. In most cases, when you make a merge close up, Everything in the subtree gets recorded, you know, as being a, having a mapping dependence on that merge close up, and then the merge close up gets recorded here, and you can forget. You can do what we do is we, we actually say we close this subtree, and that means the subtree is actually no longer has any any users in it that we need to care about for future dependence analysis, right? And that way we can, you know, only need to traverse this subtree now, which has all which is open with you know current users uh, down below it. Does that make sense? Hopefully, hopefully I haven't lost anybody. Right, and so one of the things we'll track that's very important here is like at every node in this region tree, we track whether, you know, it's, it's children are open or not. And those open children are what's gonna effectively um, allow us to know whether we need to traverse down that node, uh, that, that subtree and, and analyze it. And the nice thing about this is like this, this algorithm is actually kind of agnostic as to whether you're on a region node or a partition node kind of does the same thing regardless of like whether your region requirements are projection region requirements or, or normal region requirements. You're just kind of traversing nodes in the tree and checking to see if they're open and, and, and traversing any alias to alias subtrees. And like one cool thing that can happen here is like, you know, if your tree is actually multi-level, right, you might be traversing down a path, you know, to like a subtree down, down here, right? And you know that like, if you get to a disjoint and complete uh, partition, or sorry, if you get to a disjoint partition, Right, and you need to traverse over here. Even if there are open subregions down here, you don't need to traverse them because you're going to another subregion of a disjoint partition, and that allows you to, you know, skip having to traverse those 
parts of the subtrees, which you know, you know are not interfering because they're in a disjoint partition, right? And so you can actually skip things. But when you're traversing, like, you know, if you're at a region node and you're traversing two partitions, right, well, then it's really hard to tell whether two partitions are, are aliased with each other uh, or, or not. So you have to be a little bit, little bit careful with those two things. Okay. Um, so let's actually try to map some of this onto the code so you can actually see how some of this works uh, in practice. Okay, so, you know, for your, so back to our index task uh, trigger dependence analysis method, right? So it, it's going to call, you know, for each region requirement, we're going to iterate over all our region requirements, and we're going to do this analysis the same for, um, uh, for, for every single one of them. And we're going to call this method on the region tree uh, forest, right, which we looked at uh, the last time looking at, you know, some of the region tree nodes and, and stuff like that. And we're going to traverse uh, uh, down. Um, I, before we actually jump into this method, I do want to take one brief digression here to talk about these uh, privilege paths, right? So um, I said earlier that, uh, that you know, th these privilege paths are what's going to record the path that we're going to walk through this region tree, right? So remember I told you that we kind of start at the root and walk down to the, like the uh, the upper bound uh, data for you know our region requirement what it's asking for whether that's a region or a partition you know and a projection region requirement right like that's effectively this path that we're going to walk through the region tree from from the root down to wherever we're asking for privileges right now I I told you to to sort of ignore the fact that we're starting at this root and just sort of take that for granted earlier it doesn't have to be that you start at the root right in a case where you've actually launched you know uh, you have a tree of tasks. Right, it might be that your parent task actually started with privileges on some intermediate, you know, node in this sub in this region tree, right? In which case, you walk from whichever node your parent task has privileges on down to the node in which you're asking for privileges. So it's not always the case that you start at the root, um, but you you effectively have to start from where your parent task had privileges and you walk down to where you're asking for privileges. And so that's where these uh, these paths actually come from. These these privilege paths. And just to show you where they're actually computed, they're actually computed in this dependence now in this pre-pipeline stage. Um, so uh, let's see, where is the privilege path? Uh, initialize privilege path, right? So effectively, for each of our region requirements, you know, in this uh, this trigger pre-pipeline stage, right, which is uh, this node in the pipeline here, one of the things that we do to prepare ourselves for this logical dependence analysis is to actually compute these paths uh, as part of this pre-pipeline stage, right? So um, Right here, we iterate over you know all of our region requirements, and we initialize those privilege paths. And if I actually show you that uh, method here, oh, it might be in uh, Legion Ops. Let's see. Let's see if it's in Legion Ops. I think it might be over, because I think it's a common method that's used by pretty much every kind of operation. Initialize privilege path. Yep. And so, given a region requirement. Uh, this will effectively compute this path from uh, from you can see where our parent you know index space lives to our parent region index spaces to where the region is that we're actually asking for, or in the case of a partition, you're you know iterating from you're you're creating the path from from uh, from from where your parent you know has privileges down to the partition you're asking for privileges, right? And so so effectively uh, you can go look at this code. It's actually pretty simple, uh, but it will just build this path. Through the region tree from wherever your parent task had privileges to where you're asking for privileges. And it's going to define you know, the nodes that we'll traverse over as part of our, our logical dependence analysis. Okay, so coming back over here. Uh, where'd you go? I thought we were in Legion tasks. Uh, yep, sure dependence analysis. Right, okay, so, so now we're actually ready to actually go look at this perform dependence analysis method, right? Because you can actually see we're passing in. You know the index of our region requirement our region requirement uh, we'll skip this projection info it's used for some other stuff uh, some uh, uh, privilege analysis um, or, or the, the privilege path that we need to traverse for this region requirement as well as this uh, this logical analysis uh, structure and you can see this logical analysis structure um, is actually recording uh, is you know being used here across all of the region requirements and just to give you a brief feeling for what that's going to do. That's actually going to record all of these like um, merge close ops that we need to do, uh, as well as these refinement ops, which I'm not going to dive into today. But this logical analysis is going to track all of the close ops and all of the refinement ops that we have to do as part of like analyzing, say, like our stencil task, right? And then once we're done analyzing, you know, all of our region requirements, it'll figure out how to issue the fewest number of close ops and refinement ops uh, to make things happen happen efficiently. Um, 
so, but effectively, like as we do our traversals, it'll record the need for these things in that logical analysis. And then at the very end of this, uh, this method in the logical analysis destructor, you know, as we're about to exit the dependence analysis, that's when we'll actually issue these, these close ups and refinement ups and stuff like that. Uh, we probably won't dig into that today, but just so you know what the logical analysis you know, structure is doing, it's recording the need for these, these internal you know, merge close ops and refinement ops at the runtime, runtime generates. Okay, so let's actually go look at perform dependence analysis here. Okay, so here's perform dependence analysis uh, in the region tree. Okay, um, there's some really simple cases, like if your region has no access, there's nothing to do here. Uh, there's some support for tracing and, and stuff like that. Um, one thing I will at least do a very brief digression on today, um, and you know we'll see a lot more of this in the future, is that I've kind of been ignoring the aspect of talking about fields in these region requirements, right? So if we go back to this picture here, the stencil task you know, says you know, for, for each of these region requirements, you know, which field it's going to actually be accessing. Right, um, and the way that Legion actually will will do this analysis on on individual fields is, you know, we actually store all the data for like every region and partition in the same place, but then we have bit maps that track, you know, which fields are actually being used by different users uh, as part of these things. And so, you know, you'll see lots of code here, like when you enter the region tree forest to compute like this field mask. And so when you see these field masks that are getting made here, like this, right, using the privilege fields on our region requirements, this is just converting like our our list of fields that our region requirement is using uh, into a bit mask that we'll be able to use to efficiently test, you know, where prior users using the same fields as us as we do this uh, as we do this traversal. Um, and so you'll see you'll see lots of field masks show up, and just know that they're like bit masks to represent the fields that we're we're actually accessing. Um, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because this stuff in particular has to do with control replication, uh, which we don't want to dig into today. Uh, but we'll come back to that, you know, in some some future lecture. Um, here's the user that we're actually going, this, this logical user is actually the data structure that we're going to use to record ourselves in the region tree to actually represent re represent ourselves, you know, at a particular node in this region tree. Um, and we'll see that get recorded here. Um, uh, we're going to ignore some of the logging and stuff and some of these arguments here, which are mostly, you know, support for helping uh, with, uh, with actually doing refinements and stuff like that. So we're mostly going to ignore those things. But the important method that we do here is we actually, like, this is where we actually start our traversal of, you know, this region tree. And so you see this parent node here. This parent node actually came from right here. We get the node from our region tree, you know, of the parent uh, uh, region in our that our parent our parent task had privileges on, right? And this is where we're going to start the traversal of our region tree um, and actually walk down to each of the sub the, walk down to the sub node that we're actually going to traverse to. So this parent node, uh, error register logical user. This is where we're going to do our traversal. So this register logical user method is what's going to traverse our tree, uh, find any dependencies, and then register ourselves, you know, as a user on a particular node in the region tree. So let's actually go take a look at that method here. Okay. So, um, what's happening here? There's a few things happening. Um, the first thing that we're doing uh, as part of this method, uh, we're actually getting a reference to you know, effectively the state of this node of this region tree. Now, one thing that's, you know, kind of uh, tricky here is that if I go back to this picture here of the region tree, right, it's possible that we might actually have like multiple tasks using different parts of this region tree at the same time. Say that we had like a uh, two subtasks that both had read-only privileges on this like root region, right? Um, and they were each like doing stuff in each of these subtrees. Right, like we might actually have multiple tasks traversing this region tree at the same time. And so, you know, we actually have to have a context to actually rep figure out, you know, which parent task we're referring to. And so this git logical context or git logical state here is actually like getting a context ID for, you know, the particular logical parent task that we're, we're doing this logical analysis in. And then we can get the corresponding uh, logical state object that stores, you know, all the users and stuff like that. So let me actually show you where this actually lives uh, on the region tree. Um, actually, I'll show you what this logical state data structure actually stores, because that's actually what's important. Uh, where did my legion analysis? There it is. Oh, it might be a class. There it is. OK. So this logical uh, state data structure is actually storing all the state associated with performing the logical analysis on this node of the region tree. Uh, and you can get it for a particular context, for parent task context and so forth. There's lots of methods on this thing, but 
Um, and, and lots of this stuff having to do with, uh, with refinements and stuff, uh, some of which is soon to be deleted. But the most important stuff for our purpose today is this data structure right here. Um, so effectively, this is what this data structure right here, this ordered field mask users, right, is storing, I mean, you can think of this as a set of logical users. Uh, remember those logical users, which actually record like the names of operations uh, and how they're actually using this, this particular logical region. And I should actually show you what this logical user, user data structure looks like. We'll look at it in just a sec. But effectively, this is storing lists of all the users of this particular node in the region tree. So remember that I told you that you know, like the init task records itself as using this partition, you know, as or using this partition in the region tree. So that way, when like later tasks come in, they can actually find it. This ordered uh, these these current Epic users and previous Epic users are effectively going to be those lists of users that are going to allow us to do that analysis to find, you know, all the prior users uh, that we're going to need to find as part of as part of 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 this analysis. Um, and so, you know, on your logical state, you'll be able to find, you'll be able to find this thing. Um, there's actually one other important data structure here, I think. Uh, I thought it was on here. Um, oh, yes, the, the other important data structure here is this field state data structure. Um, this field state data structure is what tracks the names of the open children uh, in the region tree, right? So like, remember, I told you, like, on this node, we can record, like, which of these subtrees uh, have or have open state, and this field state uh, data structure is what's actually tracking that open state uh, on each of these nodes. So let's actually look at logical user and field state, and that way you can actually like see see what this is doing. So remember, this is our list of users, these current and previous Epic users. Their their list of the users, and the reason their field mask set is like each of them are associated with a field one of those bit masks to actually record, um, you know, which fields are actually being used by this particular user. Um, and so, but I'm, I'm going to try to skip over those kinds of details uh, here to, so we don't have to deal with too much field mask uh, stuff here today. So let's actually look at logical user and field state, and then we'll pop back up to, to the, the region tree analysis. Okay, so if I actually look at logical user, logical user classes, it's got a couple of methods, but it's actually pretty simple. So it's storing this region usage, which is effectively just a summary of your privileges and your coherence mode and any reduction operators that you're using. You know, it's got a pointer to the operation of that user. It's got a reference to the, you know, the the uh, the index, uh, like like which uh, sub operation launched in the parent task. You know, this was done. Which region requirement uh, this is. You know, the generation for this uh, operation uh, and so forth. Um, and it's got some other fields down here. This is more of a control application thing, and this is a, you know, this is uh, support for a special, you know, kind of a very. Uh, sort of degenerative kind of case that we have to handle. Um, but but these are the important things up here. And so this is like how we actually record a user uh, on this node in the region tree. Um, and then let's actually look at field state. So if I look at field state. So field state, again, you know, there's one of these ordered field mask things. Um, it's tracking uh, the list of sub region tree nodes, right, that are open uh, for different various different fields. It also tracks an open state. Um, so one thing that we can also track uh, in this region tree is like if you if a child is open, we also track the privileges like sort of the upper bound of all the privileges uh, that for all the users in here. So like it's one thing to know if like all the users in the subtree are open in a read only mode, right? Like if all the users are reading stuff in the subtree, and we also have you know children that are going to walk down this subtree that are also going to be reading, even though these two partitions are interfering with each other. Right, we can both leave them both open because we know that things that are read only are never going to conflict with each other. Right, so this open state, you know, is tracking. You know, is this open? You know, for reading only, or is it open for reading and writing, or is it open for reductions? And if so, what's the reduction op? Right, and so that allows us to like not necess not unnecessarily prune open trees or or sort of go down and do dependence analysis on open trees if we can avoid it. Right, if we're doing like reductions on a on another partition that might be aliasing, but but you know it's it's open in a way that's you know the same reduction op. Well, then we don't have to traverse it, right? And so so that effectively tracks like the upper bound of like what all the users are in that particular particular subtree. Um, and yeah, and then this open children is actually naming you know the various different region tree nodes that are open uh, in this particular uh, particular subtree. So like you know in our example here, you know when the stencil task was traversing here, there's exactly one open child. It's this partition node down here. 
right? And it's open, you know, with read write mode because uh, effectively there's a there's the init task down here that's that's reading and writing to this uh, this partition, right? So it's just it's just writing, uh, but it's writing to this partition, and so therefore this child is open in in a write mode. Um, and so when we go to traverse down here with the read mode, we still have to go to to, to analyze the subtree to look for for independencies and stuff like that. And we'll see the logic for, for that kind of analysis uh, in just a second here. Okay, um, let me jump back to this. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, here we go. To this register logical user class or method, right? So, so effectively, we get the state object. It's what's going to provide us all the information that we need to figure out how to do this traversal uh, down to the down to the next the next node before we get to our particular node, right? So. Um, some of the stuff, like anything you see having to do with refinement, I'm skipping over today. That's something that, you know, the topic for a, a future lecture. Um, so, you know, we can get, uh, like the, the, the important parts of this method are, you know, effectively, um, you know, there's an optimization here to say, effectively, if we're traversing a tree that's already, that we know doesn't have any open children, we can, we can skip stuff, right? And just, you know, open a new field state. But the most common case is we need to check all the interfering children you know, from a particular node and actually look to see how to close them up, right? And so this siphon interfering children method is what's actually going to do this analysis to say, you know, I'm in a particular node of this region tree, figure out which of, like, which open children interfere with me for the traversal that I'm doing, and then go traverse them and make, you know, those merge close op, uh, close ops to summarize those, those subtrees. So if we actually go uh, take a look at that siphon interfering children, and it does exactly what it says. It's it's closing up any interfering children uh, in the subtree uh, to actually be able to figure out you know can you can you close them, right? And so you can actually see this method. What it's going to do? It's going to iterate over those field states that I showed you, right? And look for ones that are interfering with us, right? And so the, and actually the first simple check that it does is it actually checks to see you know is it open for fields that I care about. If the fields that I care about, or sorry, the fields that I care about are different than the fields that this state is open for, well then I don't have to do anything in that state because like I don't care about any of those fields, right? So I can skip that uh, and move on to the next one. Um, similarly, like you know, check to see what state the uh, the the sub the children are open in in that field state, right? If they're open in read only and I'm only reading, you know, my my child that I'm walking to, right? Well then there's really like nothing for me to do there, right? Um, uh, there, right? If there, there's really, you know, if we're open read only, also, then then there's nothing to do. But if you know, if if we're not reading, if we're say we're writing or we're reducing, well, then we're going to need to perform the close operations, right? And that's effectively going to go close that subtree, make a merge close op, and record it, you know, on this node, so that we don't have to actually, you know, record some reason all of them. We're just going to record a dependence on that merge close op. And I don't think I'm going to have time to show you this perform close operation today. We'll have to leave that for another day. But but effectively, this perform close operation will then like, you know, go walk through this whole subtree, make a merge close op, and record dependencies on anything that interferes in that subtree with, you know, what we're trying to do over here. Uh, and then record the merge close op up here so that we can get a dependence on it as we're continuing our traversal uh, over here. Right, and there, there are more states here, right? So there's like the open read write state, right? You know, effectively, you know, in that case, you're probably going to need to perform a close op, you know, assuming the child is not the same one that we're walking down. There are also cases for being open with different kinds of reductions. Uh, some of the state machine stuff gets a little interesting here, so I'm not going to go through all these cases uh, here today. We might have to do that at a future time. But you know, effectively, the summary is, is like, you know, if you have if you have uh, reductions in different modes, right, then you have to, to do closes. But reductions in the same mode can can keep things open and and stuff like that. And so there's several different states here uh, in the state machine for figuring out, you know, as you're siphoning things off, uh, how to how to close things up. Um, but but effectively, uh, it's it's just figuring out, you know, which subtrees do you have to traverse to, to look for dependencies and stuff like that. Okay, so we can back to, jump back to register uh, logical user here. Right. So once we've closed, once we've siphoned up all of our you know, closed up any children that were any child nodes uh, or child subtrees that were interfering with what we need to do, right? The next thing we can do is actually, you know, perform the dependence analysis for any users on our local node, right? So like, you know, if we've, if we've done a close up here and made a merge close up up here, we need to record a dependence on that as well as any other tasks that might already have registered themselves as users on this node as we're doing our traversal down to the, the node that we're walking to, right? And so, 
this, this perform dependence checks is what's actually going to do this dependence analysis uh, for all the local users on this particular node in the region tree. Right, so we can actually go take a quick look at that. Right, and so what this is doing is it's effectively iterating over, you know, um, all of our current users on this node to find find the ones that we interfere with, um, and then recording a dependence. Right, and so you can actually see, um, you know, there's actually two lists here. Uh, this is actually an important optim optimization that I should mention as well. Um, you remember that? Let's see. I'm trying to. So let's see. Uh, let me actually just take a step back here um, and show you one. Let me describe the uh, interesting optimization, and then we can look at that method in a little more detail. So you actually notice there's two calls to perform dependence checks here, right? There's one that is done on the current Epic users, and there is one that is done on these previous Epic users. This is actually an important optimization, and what's happening here is that you know even though we might have lots of users at a particular node in the region tree, we don't actually have to record them for all time. In particular, if we know that we record a user on this node that dominates all the prior users, we can then prune out all those prior users and move them to the, the previous Epic users because we know that anything that comes later is going to record a dependence on, you know, on on either the, you know, the the something in the current Epic users or something in the previous Epic users. And that allows us to prune out things that, you know, effectively have transitive dependencies on things that came came before. Um, and so effectively we can keep two lists of like, you know, all the things that, you know, uh, are in a current epic of dependencies and all the things from the previous epic. And when we get a new thing, either it records a dependence on the, everything in the current epic and then these things like shuffle backwards, like the current epic users become the previous epic users and we start a new epic. Or we end up like uh, actually, you know, recording dependence or, or having something that's going to go into the current epic users but needs to record dependencies on all the things in the pro previous epic users. Right, and so this dominated, you know, we effectively track to see like, you know, did we dominate everything in the current epic? And if so, we can make the current epic into the previous epic and then record ourselves as the new current epic, right? If not, then we have to go, you know, record dependencies on anything in the prior epic uh, as well. And so you can see these, that's why we have these two different perform dependence checks here, right? Effectively, it's a way of not having to record everything for all, all time. We can prune out, you know, users at the current list if we dominate them uh, uh, effectively. Right, so this perform dependence checks, you know, is doing that. We do this twice in each of those those two different cases. But once you're actually in here, the method is actually pretty simple. Um, let's actually skip. I'm going to skip this if, if branch. But but what you can see here is we're actually just iterating all of, over all of these users, and then we're checking to see if there's a dependence between you know our thing and and uh, and, and other things. There's a special case here to skip dependencies on the same, you know, on the same op. If you have, have two region requirements that, you know, might look like they depend on each other in the same task, you can actually skip that here. But, you know, most of this is pretty simple, like check to see are there overlapping fields? Uh, if so, you know, then we actually check to see, like, are the dependencies, you know, are, are the dependencies between them, right? Is there either a, you know, an anti-dependence or a, re a true dependence or, or any of those kinds of things? Um, and if so, uh, I'm going to skip some of this because it has to do with control replication, but eventually like we get down here to this register region dependence. And I told you before, there's this register region dependence method, which effectively, you know, is a way to record dependencies um, uh, between two operations. And we saw that in the ops, ops class. And that, you know, tells you, you know, there's a region requirement between, you know, these two, uh, th this region requirement on this operation um, and this region requirement on, on the, this operation. Right, and this is the kind of dependence that was recorded. Uh, I'll skip the validating stuff because that's for resilience. Uh, and then these are the fields that that overlapped with it. Right, and that that creates one of those mapping dependencies, you know, that we see in this picture here. Right, between these between these things. And in this case, like dependencies are actually being recorded between like the stencil and the merge close op because like you know it summarized the dependencies in the subtree, uh, you know, from the init, init field. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time. Um, I'm gonna skip most of this method because rest of this method. Uh, I will say like you'll notice like there is this tracking whether we dominated all the prior users and stuff. Uh, so do pay attention to that because it it's important to know when you dominate that because that allows us to do the the current and previous epic optimization to you know minimize the number of users that we actually need to to analyze on any given node uh, in the region tree. Okay, so to summarize, uh, register logical user here. I think there's a few. There's there's one last part that I want to get to. So. So after we've analyzed all of our users uh, on the local node, there's sort of like two different steps of what to do. Um, 
uh, uh, in the case, so the, so the next thing we check is like, have we arrived at the node that we were traversing to? Like, are we at the, you know, do we make it to um, this, like to the node that we were traversing to as part of our traversal? And if we have arrived, um, well, that's great. Um, we can actually like, you know, record ourselves uh, in the list of users uh, and then we're done. Uh, modulo like some of this uh, refinement stuff, which again, I'll comment on on a future, future lecture. But in the case where we haven't arrived, um, we now need to traverse down uh, to the next node in the region tree. Um, I miss, again, more refinement stuff here uh, that we're gonna be able to, to not discuss today. Uh, I'm gonna skip through all the dead code that is about to be deleted. Um, let's see, where is the important recursive function call here? Uh, did I skip it? It's in here somewhere. There it is. Right, and so like we will skip some of the refinement stuff in here. Uh, I'm still in the process of cleaning some of this stuff up. This is what's actually getting fixed in the shard refinement branch. Um, but um, you know, effectively, if you know, if we haven't arrived, the next thing we do is we call re register logical user on the next node down in the region tree. Right, so that'd be the same as like you know doing our analysis here and then traversing down to the next node before we you know get to the one that we've actually actually arrived at. Um, and so this method is recursive. It traverses all the way down through this path, right? The, that we need to traverse the path that you know we computed as part of like a, our 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 uh, our, our um, pre-pipeline stage, right? For traverse for this region requirement, and we do this for uh, for for all the way down the region tree until we get to the one that we arrive at, and then we record ourselves there. At that point, we've actually finished our logical events analysis for that region requirement, and then we go and do it for the next one. And once we've done it for all the region requirements, well, then we've done the dependence analysis uh, for a particular particular operation. Um, so with that, uh, I, I, that was a lot of information, um, but that's effectively the summary of how the logical dependence analysis uh, actually works at a high level. At some point, I will come back and we will talk about all the refinement stuff that I skipped, which is another important part that the logical dependence analysis handles, but it's completely orthogonal to the stuff that uh, that we're doing as part of the dependence analysis. So like, you know, we're trying to do all this with one traversal through the region tree and that's why the code is overlaid with each other. Um, but but like effectively it's it's a completely separate part of the computation that we're doing as part of the, the traversal. So you can mostly ignore that, you know, for the purposes of thinking about dependence analysis. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions that folks have. No questions. All right. Well, um, next week, uh, Sean will be back to talk about uh, some more Realm stuff. Um, and yeah, I'm always happy to talk about uh, logical blend analysis and, and some of the stuff that's going on here. I definitely encourage you to look at some of this code, you know, in more detail. I skipped over a lot of a lot of details, um, but hopefully, this gives you the high level feel of how logical blend analysis is working. All right. See everyone next week. <laughs>